do 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 Today we'll be learning about how analytical chemists determine the amount of calories or kilojoules in food. But first we have to set down the basics and understand what a kilojoule is, what a calorie is, and what the two have in common. After that, we'll be determining different ways to find out the number of calories in food. First, the bomb calorimeter, in which you will have to understand chapters 4.1 and 4.2 of your textbook, chemical equations and combustion reactions. Lastly, don't forget your acids and bases. We'll be discussing titration in this video too. Before we get to kilojoules, let's first look at what a joule is. Now a joule is a unit of measurement for energy, and the symbol for it is J. When we have a thousand joules, we then have a kilojoule, which is expressed as KJ. Take a look at any nutritional label on a product that is sold in Canada. The word calorie has a capital C on the nutritional label. This is because there's a difference between the small c calorie and the big c calorie. 1,000 small c calories is equal to one large c calorie. So if on your juice box it says you are eating 20 large c calories, you're actually eating 20,000 small c calories. So scientists have figured out that one large c calorie is actually equal to 4.18 kilojoules. But has anyone ever really wondered about how nutritionists find this number to put on the side of an Oreo box? How about you, Chippy? All right, so let's figure it out. This device is called a bomb calorimeter. First, there are three chambers. One, the stainless steel closed vessel that acts as a conductor. And directly outside it, a container with water, and directly outside of that, another container with water. We place a small sample, liquid or solid, of maybe one to two grams of food in the closed vessel. The vessel is filled with oxygen and then ignited, so the material inside combusts. Temperatures can reach 1000 degrees Celsius. The heat from the closed vessel is transferred from the conducting steel around it to the insulating water. The temperature in the middle vessel is measured before the start of combustion and also taken at the peak of the heat, so the highest temperature that it reaches. The third vessel of water is simply used to insulate. It keeps heat from going into the vessel or out. Ta-da! But the problem with the calorimeter is that we don't digest food in the same way. For example, we don't use energy from fibers in the food. Fiber in the calorimeter will just combust like everything else in the food. Also, our body uses energy just to digest food, whereas in the calorimeter, all the energy from one piece of food is just combusted. Okay, so what's another way we can measure calories in food? Well, there is the 494 method. Oh yeah, the 494 method, also known as the Atwater method, developed by Professor W.A. Atwater. This is the method that the Food and Drug Regulations of Canadian Food Inspection Agency uses. Fat, protein, and carbohydrates are the three energy-containing nutrients. The number of calories assigned to each one are determined by average values. They were determined by burning many samples and then using the average from each of them. Moistures and fats. First, the moisture is removed from the food by placing it in an oven. The fat is calculated by a method called gas chromatography. This method separates the fat from the item and measures the amount of cumulative fats. It's rather complicated, so that's as far as we'll go. Proteins and carbohydrates. In terms of proteins, the Canadian Food Inspection see 
requires companies to use the gel doll method since proteins are always made up of nitrogen. Here, we can see a nitrogen atom in an amino acid or protein. The food is chemically digested and then converted into ammonium ions. This is an ammonium ion, which are isolated and then measured. As for carbs, it's just a process of elimination because these are the three main nutrients. It's a process of elimination, whatever's left. Do, 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 hey. The gel doll method can be divided into three parts. Digestion, distillation, and titration. Do, 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 do. In digestion, nitrogen-containing food is boiled with sulfuric acid to make ammonium sulfate, water, and other diet byproducts depending on the food that was boiled. In this picture, the protein sample is heated at a high temperature of sulfuric acid. Distillation! In distillation, the ammonia must be separated from the rest of the mixture. Therefore, we add a base, sodium hydroxide, into the digestion mixture. Through heat, an ionization reaction is completed, where the ammonium turns into ammonia gas. The ammonium gives up one of its hydrogen atoms and becomes ammonia gas. Chemists must be very careful at this point because ammonia gas can cause violent irritation of eyes, respiratory tract, cause spasms in the glottis, and also cause bronchitis. Hence, the ammonia gas is distilled out of the mixture by heating the mixture to boiling point, and then trapping the vapors in a measured amount of acid. For example, sulfuric acid. When carrying out this procedure, the chemist always remembers to wear protective clothing, as sulfuric acid at a high temperature is always very, very dangerous. Now, the flask that we use to capture the ammonium gas into the sulfuric acid actually produces excess ammonium sulfate, which has neutralized some of the sulfuric acid, and the rest of the unneutralized sulfuric acid. This is where ammonia gas turns into ammonium in ammonium sulfate. In this picture, we see the path of ammonia from digestion to distillation to capture in the trapping flask. Do, 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 do. The third part of the procedure is titration. Now here, we have our flask of analyte, the ammonium sulfate and the sulfuric acid. Then a base, such as sodium hydroxide, is titrated into the flask of analyte. An indicator has been added to the analyte, and this indicator will turn clear when the solution reaches a pH of 7, neutral. The NaOH in the brett is slowly titrated into the flask until the solution is clear. Then, we make sure to measure how much NaOH we added into the analyte. When the excess sulfuric acid is neutralized by the sodium hydroxide, we see a color change. And here is a video of a titration between an acid and a base, where the solution will turn a pink color when it has reached the pH of 7, neutral. Here is how we calculate the amount of proteins in a... We don't know the volume of ammonia that was used to neutralize the sulfuric acid but we do know the concentration and volume of the sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. Yay! Knowing the pros and cons of these methods are useful for members of the Association of Analytical Chemists, since policies and procedures of the AOAC must be followed by any product made in Canada, as is listed on the Canadian Food Inspection Agency website. But how does the nutritional label help people? Well, Chippy, for the consumers, the popular phrase, you are what you eat, applies. 
The nutritional label that shows the amount of calories, fats, carbs, and proteins help people see what they are eating. Hence, they can make healthy choices for themselves. For example, the World Health Organization determined that dietary factors accounted for 30% of cancers in industrialized countries. It also encourages manufacturers to make sure that their products are healthier, and this way they can improve them. But there's also a risk to this, as manufacturers may go to really big heights just to improve, say, the fat content of food. And we have to realize that some fat is necessary in order for the body to survive. However, not everyone always remembers that different people require different amounts of calories in their lives. A risk is that many people may be only looking at the number of calories on the nutritional label and not also look at the other nutrients and vitamins that the food provides or may not provide, hence bringing an unbalanced diet. In 2007, the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Health Canada calculated that some reductions in direct or indirect costs related to treatment for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke could save Canadians $5 billion over 20 years.